Welcome to the Sales Lab, where we share the best sales ideas, strategies, and solutions for today's housing market. My name is Anthony Gross, host of today's program. As many of you are aware, since December 2020, builders really have been severely stretched to deliver homes on time and really to provide timely responses to homeowners, both pre and post move in. You know, customer evaluations of their purchase and service experience have been trending down since the first quarter of 2021. I think that the patience initially expressed by home buyers in 2021 has been replaced by anxiety, depression, and anger. I think buyers are pretty thin right now in terms of their tolerance and their expectations. So the real question for us today is how can we deal with the anticipated impatience of customers? I mean, this is a real challenge we're gonna have to face over the next 18 months to 24 months. I think, th so to help answer this question, I've invited Bob Merman, CEO of Alliant, to be on our program. For those of you who don't know Bob, he is the founder of Alliant. He's also a trained clinical psychologist. And Bob began, actually left his clinical practice to join General Mills. Uh, I laughed because that's the serial company, Bob. General Mills as a director of customer perception research and sales motivation programs. Now he left General Mills to start National Survey Systems, which is now known as Eliant. Now Eliant over its lifespan has worked with over 1600 builders and mortgage companies and has really helped them deliver an extraordinary experience to every one of their customers, turning them into referral generators. And that's really what this is about, delivering exceptional experience. But how do we do this in that difficult time? Well, Bob, welcome to our program. I'm, in there, I'm very interested in hearing your insights today. Well, it's great to be here once again, Anthony, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your and your viewers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, over the last 18 months of COVID, it's been extremely, extremely difficult time for home builders and for lenders. I mean, looking back when this all started in what, March, 2020, when the entire country basically closed down, I think all of us assumed our entire industry would come to a grinding halt. I mean, that our ability to sell homes, complete homes and service homes really would be terminated for an unknown period of time. And as you consider these events during the early stages of the pandemic, Bob, what did you figure was going to happen to home buyer satisfaction? Well, you know, I'll tell you the truth. When it all happened last March, um, I was initially in denial. I mean, we had no experience with any kind of a worldwide disruption like this. And uh, I'm a data guy. I'm a psychologist, but I'm a data guy. I'm a data mm -hmm. wonk, in, in fact, with this company. And um, we had no data. We had no historical data to really use. So to tell you the truth, um, my denial means that I figured it was all going to be blown over by June, July of last year. And we'd all quickly return to normal and things would be hunky dory. But after a few weeks, the situation changed and mm -hmm. it's, it became it became clear that customer service wasn't progressing in any sense at all with our home builder clients. No one was able to go into their customers' homes. They couldn't go into their sales offices. So we saw at Eliant a pretty scary picture coming up with a lot of uncertainty. And we figured prospective buyers would be very hesitant to buy when there was so much uncertainty about the future and the entire economy was at a virtual standstill, of course. So mm -hmm. let's get this straight. There were no active sales offices, no action in the sales offices. There's no in-home service, no face-to-face -face relationship building, which is the basis of creating trust um, and future sales. So as a result, Anthony, to your, to your question, we assumed, I assumed that customer satisfaction would basically tank. That's what I assumed. Does that sound reasonable, Anthony? Yeah, it, it does. And I, I assume the same thing. You know, when you're unable to deliver face to face communication with the customers, you really can't be yeah. uh, build, build the trust. And that to me really seemed like the death knoll for home buyer satisfaction scores. Um, yeah. And I know Alliant receives thousands of surveys from new home buyers every month, which is fantastic. You get deep detail from them. What did you see in these customer evaluations? during this period? Ah, this is where it gets interesting, Anthony. You know, during the, the, the first few months of the pandemic, which is figure about a half a year after that, mm -hmm. we received 76,000, a little over 76,000 
completed evaluations from homeowners of our 190 or so builder clients. So we got a, a strong database, as you just inferred in your statement about mm -hmm. the number of surveys we get. So if you look back at March and April, the first couple of months of the pandemic, the satisfaction scores that we were seeing in all departments, that sales through customer service declined a bit, as you would expect. In fact, we were a little bit surprised that they didn't go down more uh, because this was a period of extremely poor service generally mm -hmm. and incredible uncertainty. So there's no, there's no surprise that it went down a little bit, Anthony. Um, but we expected this decline to continue for the foreseeable future because builders were still trying to figure out exactly how to set expectations, how to respond to service calls, how to deal with customers in a time when they couldn't deal with customers face to face. So mm -hmm. you take a look at our key measures index, which is our basic measure of overall satisfaction and includes a question about quality of the home. Did mm -hmm. you meet, did the builder meet its commitments to you and how likely are you to now recommend if you take those three questions and average them out, that's our key measure mm -hmm. uh, index. And those index, that index continued at a fairly high level in every department through the end of the year in light of what was good, in spite of what was going on. Um, and December went down a little bit. It was the lowest month of the year. But when you mm -hmm. take a look back at 2020 as an annual score, which we do, and compare it to every year for the last 15 years, and we've been doing this for 37 years, mm -hmm. of course, but you take a look at just the last 15 years, going back to the Great, Re the Great Recession, this was the lowest score for any year. I'm sorry, this was the highest score. My apologies. This is the highest score for any year since 2011, in spite of all the stuff that was going on. Now, Anthony, you're a very rational guy, I know you, but doesn't that sound a bit crazy? It's, yeah. I mean, you would think, I mean, if you, if what you just said, you just said that in 2020, home buyer ratings went up in every purchase experience. Yeah. Um, and everyone expected them to, to decline. How, I mean, how do you explain an increase in customer satisfaction during such a traumatic and stressful period? Well, it became a little obvious pretty, pretty quickly what was going on. Um, and I'll tell you how that works. The first thing that, that we saw happening, because, and we were part of it because we got a lot of calls from our clients mm -hmm. saying, how can we change the way we set expectations in light of the fact that the supply chain was mm -hmm. a disaster? and still is, um, but it, it came on with such a shock and lumber prices went up immediately. I mean, all these things were happening um, and it was difficult to deliver homes on time. So we had to urge all of our clients to change the way they made promises and it didn't take much urging. They were coming to us as well. So mm -hmm. most builders changed the way expectations were being set and they became much more realistic, much more transparent, um, and much more inclusive in terms of the information which was being shared. So that's what we, we put together videos and training and articles and webinars. Um, and that helped to turn the tide. Not that we did it. I'm saying that our builders made the decision to change the way mm -hmm. they were making promises. So that was the first thing. Because basically, as you know, it, there's only two ways to change customer satisfaction. One, you get better at what you're doing in terms of the way you perform. And number two, you get better at making promises that you can keep. That's it. Changing expectations, change performance. Absolutely. Two things. So uh, they were getting better at setting expectations and hopefully getting better at performance. But we know it wasn't good because they couldn't get into their homes to do the service. And service is such a key thing. So that's the expectation setting was number one. But number two is the real kicker. Number two is where it all changed. We get as I said, we got 76,000 surveys returned during that first half a year after COVID started. Each of those surveys has an average of three to four comments that buyers type in to explain their answers. So if you take 75,000, figure 75,000 surveys, and you get an average of four comments apiece, that's 300,000 comments. And for those of you who are listening to this that are our clients, you know that our reports are sortable. You can sort all the comments by topic and by community and by the name of the rep 
who is responsible for that buyer in sales and construction, et cetera. So we can go through and sort for words, for, for key words. And what we started to see almost immediately was a difference in the attitude of these customers. And it was measurable. Mm -hmm. The customers still complained. Homeowners still complained about the lack of service and the delays and all that stuff. But they added words after their complaint, such as, but we understand. That was one of the most common phrases or the word understand was one of the most common words that we found starting from that point. That's empathy. Or mm -hmm. we look forward to having this repaired as soon as things normalize. A lot of comments like that when they were talking about complaints about service untimeliness. My favorite was how, to, how can I blame you when you were facing the same problems as my family and my company? So there was this empathy that became obvious right from the start that just grew over the first few months particularly. And we began to call it, we, we gave it a name, pandemic-based empathy. Um, and that's really based on the psychological concept that you may be familiar with, which is called the common enemy theory. It's mm -hmm. that, and that's the theory where you can have two diverse groups, antagonists, protagonists, typically mm -hmm. against each other or are working at odds with cross purposes. You got a builder and you got buyers and they each have different interests. They don't always me mesh. But when you now lock horns and say, now you're going to be facing a common enemy, which is COVID. And the common theme is we're all in this together. That's empathy. And that creates tolerance for poor service and for delays. Um, so, Anthony, that's that's 2020. Welcome to the homeown. Welcome, welcome to the honeymoon phase of our existence with, with COVID. That was the honeymoon. Yeah, I mean, 2020 is a real conundrum. I mean, I'm totally surprised to learn that home buyers are so willing or were so willing really yeah. to give such strong ratings when they probably weren't receiving the level of service that they really needed or wanted. Okay. So that was 2020. Now we're yeah. deep into 2020, 2021 has, yeah. has this changed? Well, if 2020 was interesting, 2021 is totally weird, totally weird. Um, somewhat explainable, but still weird. You see, what happened is that in the first quarter of 21, I mentioned earlier in this conversation that December scores dropped a little bit. So 2020 was at a pretty high level and then dropped a little bit in December. That stayed pretty constant throughout the first quarter. But then as the Delta wave of COVID really took, took a hold of this country and the world again in uh, June, mm -hmm. scores dropped precipitously. Our overall satisfaction scores across the board, across the nation, we work in about 25, 28 states, whatever it is, um, drop precipitously across the board. July dropped again. So we went from this kind of normal level in the beginning of the year, June, July took, took a big drop. Now the question is, it was, it was coincidental with the Delta surge. I think what happened was, as we explain it and look at it, um, is that we all kind of thought we were out of it. I mean, I remember I was feeling pretty good about four or five months going into the year that mm -hmm. we were going out of it. Travel was coming back. We had to wear masks on the plane. Yeah, but travel was starting again. We were tra I was traveling. I thought we were out of it. Once again, I was in denial based on what happened with the Delta variant. Um, but it, it's clear looking back at June that the honeymoon is over. 2020 was the honeymoon. We're out of that now. We're, mm -hmm. we're way too tired of being beat up by, by COVID and its restrictions to display any degree of empathy anymore. We have little empathy left to give as a culture. Um, you know, we still put up with, with the things we have to do, but th this common enemy theory, putting up with excuses from our builder, no longer take, take precedence. If you're like me, we're both ready to, for COVID to disappear. It's like, my, my patience is wearing thin like my old pair of jeans. I mean, I just, it's gone. It's not here anymore. And now, unfortunately, we're entering into another series of lockdowns, increases in hospitalizations of our kids, uh, divorce rates, which went down in 2020, counter to what most people think, divorce rates actually went down. And it's probably because people couldn't get to lawyers. They couldn't get out 
to do what they wanted to do. So they lived with their spouses under difficult conditions, of course, and a lot of stresses and strains when you're home every day with someone that you weren't used to being with. So I'll tell you the truth, uh, and that's going to go up. Divorce rates will go up in the next couple of years dramatically. That's all the predictions, and I understand why. Uh, but for yeah. the first time in 37 years, Eliant has issued what we call a red flag warning because it's the first time we've ever had to do this to warn our clients. And now we're warning you that your buyers are going to become much more assertive and aggressive and angry, irate over the next six months to 12 months until we get out of COVID, mm -hmm. until we get our supply chain problems fixed. And so I'm going to read what we are telling our clients when complaining about real or perceived issues, new home buyers are now more likely to become increasingly vocal, irate, and even aggressive when their requests do not receive the expected level of response. So be prepared for the fact, Anthony, that your customers from the lending side and our builder mm -hmm. customers um, are going to be increasingly upset, impatient, and even angry and assertive about phrasing the way they need to get things done and their reactions are going to be rather vocal so get ready uh, for it anthony well i am probably not telling you anything new it's already started. well we already see that and there's a term i use called buyer fatigue i'm already seeing yeah. it with uh our borrowers with buyers at the new home communities and it's all the above uh it's the buying process the lack of inventory the supply chain issues it's how they feel that they're being treated. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. It's a cumulative response. And in fact, Fannie Mae just came out with a recent home buyer survey where they asked buyers, is it a good time to buy a home? And it is at the lowest level mm -hmm. it's been at in 10 years, which I think is just an indicator of how people are, are feeling. And it's not just one thing, it's cumulative to them. But so apparently the pandemic based empathy was short term. Um, yeah. And so how do builders prepare for difficult buyers? I mean, it, it's it's here. We're going to have to be dealing with them this year. I think we're probably going to be dealing with them probably through the end of next year as well. So what can we do to prepare? What should builders be doing? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I agree that it's not near done yet. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to have to face these difficult buyers for at least the next six to 12 months at an escalated level over where we're used to. So. I have five things, five things that we feel have to be done by a builder or a lender in order to prepare your field representatives for what could be a difficult period here in working with a lot more difficult buyers volume wise, but also more vociferous, more angry, uh, more verbal about their anger as well. So the first thing is you got to let your, your field reps know this is coming. It's here. They already see it. We've heard too many stories in the last few weeks about sales associates crying, literally, um, at meetings because they were so frustrated with having to deal with this. So it's already started. It's just going to get a little bit worse over time. So you need to let let your people know that this is here and it's, it's going to get a little bit worse. Mm -hmm. So they expect it. And when you tell them that, there has to be some training that has to go along with it. Just this video could be and should be shared, I think, with your field representatives to know about what's going on and why, because many of them take it to heart to such an extent that they think they're the blame. They should be blamed for this. This anger that you're seeing, this escalated anger is not directed at the rep because of what the rep did or didn't do most of the mm -hmm. time. It's because of this general sense of frustration and anxiety and anger at the cultural situation, situation that we find ourselves in. And that creates, it's like you go to work during the day, you have a tough day, you come home, the smallest little thing kind of sets off your fuse. And that's where we're mm -hmm. all at right now. It's not an easy time. So let them know that your buyers are more likely to be impatient and angry. It's not just at you. It's at the situation that they find themselves and train them to deal with difficult buyers. Our training on that subject, and there's many companies that do this. I'm not selling our training. But it, it, it incorporates things like listen carefully, shake your head yes, Mm -hmm. Verbally approve of what they're saying. Understand it. Not approve, but understand it. Empathize. Boy, that must be a difficult thing for your family that your dishwasher is still not working. I mean, if it was my family, I would be upset about it, too. So I understand. I mean, there's a validation that goes into that that makes them feel like you're listening, like you care. 
You've got to convince them that you do care. Um, apologize. Thank them for their patience when they express patience and act in a patient manner when things are tough. Mm -hmm. um, tell them exactly what you're going to do. I'm going to talk to this person, this person. I'll get back to you in three days. And when you say you're going to get back in three days, that means you're going to get back in two or even one. Always beat your promise. Follow it up with a written note to tell them what you're going to do and you, that you understand. You've got to convince your buyers that you understand their, their situation. If it's a really difficult situation there, send them a gift card. I don't care where it's from. It could be from Starbucks. It could be from Nordstrom. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be 10, 20, 25 bucks. It's just, and there's a note with it. And that's the way to, to help them be convinced that you understand what they're doing and you're trying to do something about it. Number two, manage expectations. Don't let your buyers set your standards and expectations for you. Let them know what the, what the expectation is and be absolutely honest. Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, your, your moving date is going to be sometime in the second quarter of 2022. But to tell you the truth, the way things are going right now, delays are inevitable. Lower the expectations so you can beat them. Only make promises you can beat and not just meet, but beat. And when you're making promises, particularly about scheduling, make sure you check that with construction. Make sure that you guys are on the same page. Mm -hmm. Don't promise things that, that construction knows are never going to be possible. And try to beat those expectations. Over-communicate is number three. Under-communicating is death. If your buyers don't hear from you, they're going to think that you've forgotten about them or that the worst, the worst case. In the absence of communication, people always think the worst. Here's my one suggestion for the level of communication that you should, uh, that you should use. Mm -hmm. Always consider that the buyer is your best friend. Consider what would you do if this buyer was your best friend? How would you communicate bad news? How would you communicate status of construction, loan status? Would you do it differently for your best friend than you're doing for your buyer? If so, change it. Change your mindset so that you're thinking about your best friend. Number four, proactive communication. Your buyers must receive mm -hmm. frequent updates on construction and loan status. And here are the key words, before they have to ask. Proactive communication about status and over communicate on that. Send them pictures of communicate of, of your of construction of their home. Let them know where the status is. Ask them at at purchase, what's their preference for the manner in which they'd like to be communicated? Text, email, phone, which of those three works best? And then send them photos during the construction cycle. That is the number one thing that our highest rated builders have told us that, that they do that makes the biggest difference. And finally, one additional thing, number five, call your buyers more frequently just to say, how are you doing? You know, it just, it's not a hard thing to do. It's relatively easy. It won't take very long. How did your move go? Um, I know you're moving in two weeks. Is there anything we can do to help you? Um, I know your dishwasher um, hasn't been working and I, it's on order. I know how inconvenient that is for you as it would be for my family. I just wanted to assure you that we're doing everything possible to expedite the delivery. And I'm going to get back to you in three days and let you know how that is, how it's going which means you're going to call them in one day or two days because you promise three. Always beat the promise. So those are the five things that need to be done, and they're not hard to do. They don't take a lot of time. They just take a little switch in perspective to make those happen. And that's yeah. the, I think that's the solution, really. Yeah, they take a commitment. But the things, two things that really stand out, Bob, and yeah. I've, had, I've had the luxury of – knowing you, hearing you speak, uh, reading your papers for the last 10, 11 years, things that stick with me for all sales leaders, proactive communication, not reactive. Absolutely one of the best things that you've ever said yeah. in terms of, yeah. you know, when I'm leading salespeople, what I'm talking about. Number two is beat the expectation, don't meet the expectation. And if there's two things to take away, those are really critical for me. Uh, I've seen that when those are actually implemented, it makes yeah. such a difference. 
And you know what happens when you beat their expectation and you have proactive communication? It cuts down dramatically on inbound calls and emails and oh, all of that stuff that. that clogs up your life. Yeah. Yeah. So you spend a little more time making proactive calls of status. And what mm -hmm. that does is it eliminates most of the calls that your buyers would be giving you and bothering you to find out about status. So your, your time is actually a little bit less, but the satisfaction level that you're generating from that is so much higher, so much higher. Yeah. Show you care. Go out of your and way to show that. I'm sure everybody listening to this loves that email that arrives Friday afternoon from a customer who's got hard questions uh, yeah. because we weren't yeah. proactive. You know, those, these are the types of things we can reduce. Yeah. Well, Bob, you know, you have an upcoming white paper. I have read it. Uh, it's a great article that you've written called The Rise and Fall of Pandemic-Based Empathy. I love your title. Uh, yeah. when, when is this going to be released uh, to the public, to builders, to their sales teams, and where can they find uh, these articles? Or this yeah. article, excuse me. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, the, uh, the article on pandemic-based empathy and the solutions that we just talked about, a summary of what we just talked about, is actually on our website now in the blog section. And I believe it's being released today um, on um, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So if you go to Eliant you'll, or, or my name, Bob Merman, you will get a copy of that. It's there. Excellent. Yeah, we're going to release it as well um, on yeah. our blog and, and feature that, Bob. But so much appreciate you being on today. I think the decline in buyer empathy is here for a while. And really, our builders having the ability to address it or have a plan is going to be critical. And so thank yeah. you for outlining that to us today. I uh, really appreciate that. And for all of our listeners, thank you for being on today. I hope you found this very helpful. Have a great day and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you.